This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. Okay, good morning everybody and welcome to the 84th meeting of the Economy Committee. Some members will be attending this morning's meeting via Starleaf and our witnesses will be briefing us this morning via Starleaf. The meeting will be broadcast live when open to the public and a recording will be made available on the committee's webpage on the Assembly website. The bill briefings will be hand started as per protocol and just to remind members to mute their tablet devices when um, they're not speaking. So moving on to item number one, uh, which is apologies. We have no apologies this morning. So moving on then to item number two, 
Um, there is a copy of the draft minutes of the meeting held on the 8th of December at page 5 of our pact. Are members content that those are an accurate reflection of the meeting? Good. Yep. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> So moving on then to item number three, which is chair's business, and just to advise members that the interparliamentary forum on Brexit that I was due to attend last Friday was cancelled due to the change in um, advice in, in Westminster, so I didn't travel to London. Um, and just I suppose also members will have seen the publication, yes, no, Tuesday of the audit office report into Project Stratum. Um, so obviously there were some issues highlighted there. Peter, I assume that goes to PAC. Yeah, Chair, PAC have already asserted primacy and they are um, in the midst of organising their inquiry and seeking witnesses. So um, we will stand by while they do that and then we can pick up once they've finished. Okay. So will, they, will they be asking? I mean, obviously we, we have a lot of detail around projects, but will they be asking us or will they just... They will get that direct. Will our minutes and our notes, etc.? Chair, they, they, I've, I've spoken to the clerk, we fortunately share an office, and um, they have all that detail. Um, they get it direct from the department. Anything they need from us, we'll supply. Um, okay, thanks. And then just, I suppose, to mention, obviously, members are still being contacted considerably in relation <laughs> to the High Street Voucher Scheme. And uh, I was made aware yesterday that the Spend Local email has replied to some MLAs saying that they're no longer taking individual queries, which isn't particularly helpful for many people who still haven't received the card. So perhaps if we could just maybe ask the department if they could be a bit more flexible around that. Um, obviously, we understand that there's limited time now to get cards out to people, but there are still people who have um, more complex queries than just, where's my card? So um, it, it's obviously, if they're coming to MLAs, it's, MLAs need to be able to get responses as well. Okay, so moving on then to item number four, which is um, our briefing this morning from RAISE on the domestic, abu uh, domestic Abuse Safe Leave Bill. There is a briefing paper from RAISE at page 15 of our PACs. And if I could just bring into the spotlight, please, um, Orla Drummond, who is a research officer in RAISE, and Michael Scholes, um, also a research officer in RAISE. So if I hand over to yourselves to make an opening statement, and then we will open it up to members for questions. Um, thank you very much, Chair. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure if um, I think Orla McHugh, or sorry, Neve McHugh is also um, to oh, be yes. put into the spotlight in the presentation. We're just doing okay. That. There we go. Okay. Can you hear uh, hear me and see me? Okay, Chair. We can. Yes. Thanks. Great. Um, so I'm going to summarise the, the key points of the paper and then hand over to Orla and Neve, um, who is, are going to discuss the uh, quality implications of the bill. Um, so the paper really aims to support uh, the committee and the wider assembly in its scrutiny of the domestic abuse safe leave bill. And uh, throughout the paper, um, we have presented issues or questions uh, for the committee in blue boxes that they may, um, may feel uh, be useful. Section one then of the paper provides, uh, by way of context, a statistical profile of domestic abuse in Northern Ireland. Um, in 2021, approximately 31,000 domestic abuse incidents were reported, um, and there were 19,000 domestic abuse crimes also recorded. Now, this is the highest level um, since the data series began in 2005. And statistics also show that there's been a reported increase of domestic abuse during COVID-19 lockdown periods. So section two then uh, on page 23 of your pack gives an overview of the bill and of the public consultation held earlier on this year. Um, the key findings uh, revealed that 96% of those who replied to the consultation believed that paid leave for victims and survivors of domestic abuse should be put on a statutory footing. And the Domestic Abuse Safe Leave Bill was introduced to the Assembly as a private member's bill on the 19th of October 2021. So the Safe Leave Bill creates a statutory entitlement to paid leave for the victims of domestic abuse. The bill as introduced provides the, that the Department for the Economy must make regulations entitling an employee or a worker who is a victim of domestic abuse to be absent from work. 
Now these uh, regulations will provide approval, uh, will, sorry, will require approval of the Assembly via the negative resolution procedure. So safe leave is paid leave um, designed to be used by the employee or worker to deal with issues related to domestic abuse, including but not limited to obtaining legal advice and pursuing legal proceedings, uh, finding alternative accommodation, taking advantage of healthcare, and that includes mental health care, uh, obtaining welfare support and protecting family members. And safe leave is to be set for a minimum of 10 days per year. Now, the bill does not prescribe specific elements relating to pay, um, notice periods or proof of domestic abuse. The detail of these and other issues are to be introduced via the regulations uh, brought forward by the DFB. So section three then on page 26 of your pack discusses the key provisions of the bill in more detail. The bill uses behaviours described in section one of the Domestic Abuse Civil Proceedings Act to define domestic abuse. Um, however, that Act's definition has attracted some criticism, um, mainly for not including a single definition of domestic abuse. And also some stakeholders felt that it fails to capture the essence of the psychological harm um, caused by domestic abuse. Um, so provision in the bill extends safe leave entitlements to workers as well as employees. Now this is worth um, pointing out because the interaction between employment status, NI law and the proposed regulations may prove challenging, um, particularly in cases where it's difficult to establish um, employment status, such as in the gig economy. Um, the bill sponsor has expressed a wish that no requirements should be needed to provide proof of domestic abuse, um, and the bill does not explicitly state that proof of abuse is required. Um, however, the bill does allow supplementary regulations um, to be brought forward by the department with um, regard to notice procedures. And this arguably gives authority to the department to shape the notification process. So moving on to section four um, on page 35, um, this provides a comparative perspective of other jurisdictions. So globally, the Philippines, New Zealand, Australia, Canada, and Italy um, provide statutory provisions on domestic abuse leave. Um, however, statutory paid leave is only offered in New Zealand, Canada, and Italy. Um, so section five then really takes up uh, other issues uh, that are concerned uh, with the bill. Now, Neve and uh, Orla are going to speak to the human rights and equality issues of that shortly. Um, so other issues really include um, parity, which is uh, an issue that I'm going to discuss briefly now. Um, currently in GB, there's no statutory leave payments for the victims of domestic abuse. If safe leave bill is introduced as enacted, a statutory payment would be available for victims only in Northern Ireland. Now, this may mean by offering enhanced entitlements to employees and workers not otherwise available in England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland could be in breach of the Treasury parity principle, uh, which states that people in the UK all pay the same rate of income tax and uh, national insurance contributions and are therefore entitled to the same benefits and rights. Um, there remains a risk that if the UK government is required to restore parity in future by introducing equivalent statutory safe leave payments in GB, Treasury could seek to recoup the cost of doing so from the executive's budget. Um, if this is the case and the UK government sought to restore parity in GB at some future date, uh, following the enactment of the bill, the estimated liability for the Northern Ireland budget per annum could be considerable. Um, so in terms of costs, again, the, the bill that's introduced places a duty to, um, to publish an annual report uh, on the uh, Department for the Economy to monitor compliance with the bill. Um, the DFE estimate that the cost of producing this annual report from within existing resources would be approximately £7,200 a year. Um, if a newly established team were set up um, to do this, then the annual cost 
uh, would be estimated at some around £76,000. And the DfE also presented annual costs for the public purse at various take-up levels um, of domestic abuse leave, assuming that the bill was uh, enacted. Now, these range from £145,000 if 500 individuals each take three days per leave uh, in uh, one calendar year. And also, um, they range up to nearly £10 million for take-up of 10,000 individuals each taking 10 days per leave each year. Uh, so thank you, Chair. Um, that's a brief run over of the, uh, of the key points of, of the paper. And I'll now hand you over to Neve and Orla for their presentation on the human rights and equalities considerations. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. <clears throat> Good morning. Uh, I'm going to briefly cover the beginning of Section 5 of the Bill paper, which looks at human rights and equality considerations. Um, and that's on page 39 of your pack. So while domestic abuse is often treated as a private concern for criminal and civil proceedings, there are a number of human rights that are impacted, which invoke a positive obligation on states to mitigate harm to victims and to provide support mechanisms. Positive obligations occur when states must guarantee human rights in circumstances where state agents do not directly interfere. Human rights and human rights law is generally concerned with the relationship between the citizen and the state, but in certain circumstances, the state must try and mitigate harm between citizens. Um, two examples of positive duties in the realm of domestic abuse concern the right to life and the right not to be tortured or to experience inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. The positive duty to protect life means that the state should intervene when someone's life is at risk from another person and where the authorities know or should know about this risk. And this includes protecting a person from domestic abuse. International standards on the right to life are enshrined in Article 3 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 6 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and Article 2 of the European Convention on Human Rights. And the right is domestically protected by the Human Rights Act of 1998. Additionally, domestic abuse victims are protected by the right not to be tortured or treated in a manner that is cruel or degrading. So, for example, Article 3 of the Human Rights Act of 1998 imposes a positive obligation on public authorities to protect citizens from serious ill treatment by other individuals. So, the positive duty included in this right means that the that public bodies such as governments and the police have an obligation to protect at-risk individuals from Article 3 violations by private citizens. And the United Nations human rights bodies have made a wide range of statements on the issue of domestic violence and have placed a broad range of obligation on states as regards this area. These obligations not only relate to the protection from harm, but to the support mechanisms required to aid domestic abuse victims. So as noted by rights NI, these duties include improving the responses of states' criminal justice systems, ensuring that civil law measures are effective, implementing public awareness campaigns, and crucially, providing social support mechanisms and measures such as housing, refuge accommodation, and childcare facilities to victims. Therefore, the introduction of this bill would be a step towards meeting those positive obligations in relation to supporting victims and survivors of domestic abuse, thereby enhancing human rights protections. The ability for these, those affected to access pay leave means they're economically protected to seek support and guidance in a time of crisis. Um, so that's part one of section five. I'm now going to hand you over to Neen to discuss any additional human rights elements. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Following on from Orla, I will now highlight the key areas in regards to section 5.12, enhancing human rights protections. Firstly, it is important to consider the wider context of support mechanisms which are in place and available for victims, in particular, the accessibility to support services in Northern Ireland. If victims or survivors of domestic abuse can access a leave entitlement, but cannot access support services, this could reduce the attainment of the bill sponsor's intended objective. For example, the Human Rights Watch have highlighted that there are insufficient measures to ensure critical support and services for survivors of violence, especially those least likely to get help. They note that before the COVID-19 pandemic, support for specialist domestic abuse services was already a national crisis, and this situation has now been further exacerbated. 
In relation to the protections of Section 75 of the Northern Ireland Act, there is a strong concern regarding the lack of access to domestic abuse services for migrant, black, Asian and minority ethnic women. Examples of barriers for these communities include access to a phone, language barriers, as well as their immigration status. This is because it can be used to control them or prevent them from seeking help, and they may fear approaching authorities due to the risk of detention, deportation, or separation from their children. These barriers therefore highlight the additional and specialised support systems these communities require. In May last year, Amnesty International urged the Northern Ireland Executive to provide emergency funding to groups helping victims of domestic violence. This is because it claimed that significant additional funding has been made available to Women's Refuge and other groups in every other part of the UK except Northern Ireland. As discussed previously, there are a number of positive obligations placed upon states to ensure the protection of their citizens from the detrimental impact of domestic abuse including the obligation to ensure effective support mechanisms. While the introduced bill enhances the protection of employees and workers within the workplace, it is vital to ensure that valuable supports are also in place. Last year, the Chartered Institute of Personal and Development and the Equality and Human Rights Commission published a guide for employers on managing and supporting employees experiencing domestic abuse, of which they made 10 key recommendations for employers, which is detailed in your information packs. This report provides a point of reference and some wider considerations of how to support domestic abuse victims within the workplace and could enhance the effectiveness of the bill's sponsor's intended purpose of for this bill. In terms of potential scrutiny points, these centre around the provision and enhancement of support services, especially around migrant and BAME communities as well as the consideration of the recommendations made by the Chartered Institute of Personnel and Development and the Quality and Human Rights Commission. Okay, thank you, Neve. Um, <coughs> Chair, that, that's um, our presentation, so we're uh, very happy to take any questions that the um, committee may have. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that. It's um, very helpful, and thank for thank you for the briefing paper, which is um, considerable as always, and um, all of the scrutiny points we will be um, sharing with the bill sponsor and with the department to um, get the further information um, to support the committee's deliberations on the bill. Um, could I just maybe go back to the the financial um, implications of the bill? Could you just talk us through um, your understanding of? how the payments will be made. So obviously um, there will be obligations on employers um, to support workers if this leave is put in place or the paid leave is put in place. So is there also um, a, a statutory obligation then for workers whose employers don't um, pay them that money or it's not within their contract? How does that work? What is your understanding of, of how that will work? Um, well, well, my understanding in, in terms of the um, the costing and the power of the issue is that the uh, employer, well, interestingly, unlike the parental bereavement leave uh, bill, there's no la la, uh, there's no explicit liability to pay on employers in this legislation as it was in the previous one. So that's that's one point. Um, however, the my understanding of the whole process is basically that employers. Um, will pay the leave in ordinary and other statutory provisions like say for example, sick pay um, or maternity pay the employer would pay the employee the um, the bent the the their normal wages if you like and then the employer can claim back um, the money from HMRC now this money then um, if you like is totaled by HMRC in, in the end of one uh, one um, calendar year, financial year, and then the name and then that scores off the Northern Ireland AME payments. So so they are, if you like, social security payments, so it falls under AME. So um and again that this is possibly questions for the Department for Communities regarding that. But then if Northern Ireland were to step outside those arrangements and introduce a new um entitlement like um domestic abuse pay um, then there would be 
potential uh, for um, the executive to be breaking um, this parity agreement with Treasury. And then the, um, so if in future then the GB um, were to legislate and introduce the domestic abuse leave pay elements for England, Scotland and Wales, um, the, the ramifications of that could be um, that um, that would be impacted on um, the Northern Ireland Executive Dale budget, not the Amy budget. So in effect, we would be potentially um, punished for that break of parity. Uh, punished is um, um, quite a strong word there, but um, it all depends on negotiations with Treasury and the Department of Finance. So really, um, the whole point of mentioning this in the paper is really to raise the issue. Um, I'm not a finance expert. Um, I think for the committee it would be a good idea to seek clarification on this point from the Department for Finance, Department for Communities and the Department for uh, the Economy um, because the, it's not um, a straightforward matter parity. Um, it's not a statutory position. It's a, it's a tre tre treasury procedure. Um, so it depends on the negotiations um, and um, as I say, the whole point of that particular section is really to raise that as an issue for the committee. Okay. No, thanks for that. And obviously, we've had some considerable discussion around the, that particular point in relation to the parental bereavement leave bill and where the, I guess, the crossover happens in terms of what is a devolved policy area and then the, the Treasury guidance around that. And we have sought legal advice in, in respect of that, but we can also raise the points with the, with the, the various departments in relation to it. So that's, that's useful. Mike, you're in for a question. Yeah, th thank you, Chair. It's, it's the same <clears throat> issue, uh, Michael. Is, are you aware of any example of Treasury uh, enforcing the cost of parity on any devolved administration? Um, I, they, I, I'm not a uh, chair, but I, I am not a finance expert. Um, so possibly colleagues in the financial scrutiny unit may be able to come back to you on that. Um, but I am not uh, personally aware of that level of detail would be beyond the scope of this particular paper. Yeah, and, and consequent to that, Michael, um, are you aware whether Treasury uh, have the power to impose that financial obligation or whether it would require legislation through Westminster? Um, well, all I can say is, uh, as I mentioned before, the parity principle per se um, is, um, if you like, written down in the statement for funding policy, which is produced at a spending review or a fiscal event. There's a, usually a new one, which is kind of explains the public finance system. Um, so that is not per se on a statutory footing. Um, so, I think it would be, again, up to the Department of Finance and Treasury to enter negotiations on how um, possible parity um, implications uh, could be sorted out, if you like. Okay, but I'm, I'm still not clear whether at the on foot of those negotiations, whether it would then need to pass through Westminster as a piece of primary legislation. Well, I, I, I can't really give an answer to that now. Um, um, I agree that is, that is definitely a point worth raising with the, the, perhaps the finance department. Okay, okay. The, the other issue was the safe leave is set at a, a minimum of 10 days per annum. Well, yes, that's correct. What, what if I only need five or six days? Well, then that's, um, well, that's, th th then you would only take five or six days. But you have the ability to take. Yes, it's a settlement. So you, um, so basically, you you have a leave entitlement of ten days per year at a minimum. Um, so basically, the legislation says that um, employers must um, allow for ten days minimum right. uh, of domestic abuse. But if you only need um, five or six days, then that that's absolutely fine. Okay, right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Mike. Peter. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Chair. Thank you for the, the, the presentation and the information. I suppose a couple of points. Um, I'm going to come back to the, the, the parity point in a minute. Um, one of the other issues when you were looking at international comparisons, um, I, one of the issues which would have been a wee discussion with the bill sponsor 
I, I know that it's the issue you've raised about the, uh, which we'll obviously pursue up, on the, the definition of, of uh, if we're talking about employment, we're talking about workers, whether uh, zeros are a contract. I know that, to be fair, I think the sponsor had indicated she wasn't quite sure what the scope would, would cover. I suppose that's one of the areas we can explore. But one of the other issues I think was raised, I think, uh, I think of Keith raised with the sponsor, uh, and he's most looking then also at international comparison, is to the scope then that, that who is, comes under the, the definition of um, qualifying under the domestic abuse side of it, because there was the issue of, um, whereas again, in pure numbers, this is maybe a little bit at the margins, but um, if it's a question of, for example, in a family setting where it is the, um, uh, the employee is the son or daughter and living in the house of, perhaps, for instance, say the mother is the actual direct victim, mm -hmm. whether there's uh, whether in terms of where it's been used elsewhere, you know, what the scope of definition, whether a direct or indirect victim and, and how much that, that's covered, whether that's been limited, whether it is the limitation is purely on the basis of a, uh, of a residency side of things on it. I just wonder if there's any comments you have in connection with that. Yeah, I, um, I think the, the, the bill sponsor left that um uh, issue uh, uh, vague, uh, well, not vague, sorry, that's a wrong use of the word, but the broad, um, broad um, definition there really um, for various reasons because clearly if, clearly if the, um, in your example, if the mother was um, a victim of domestic abuse then she can claim the pay, but I think possibly what you're um, potentially getting to, Mr Weir, is that if, if a child was abused um, in, in the um, in the home, would would the parent, uh, the mother or father, if you like, be able to claim um, this form of domestic abuse? So I, I think in uh, in certain, I think in, the, in Australia there is a stipulation that if a child is involved in uh, the abuse, then they, you know, that would um, cover if you if you like the the parent's right to claim the domestic abuse, um, and leave and pay. And on that basis, so does, does, does the flip side also? Uh, or is it purely related to it, where it's a, um, a child victim um, situation? Because, I mean, I'm conscious of the fact, again, it may be more relatively rare, but if you had, for example, um, that the, the mother of the household, you know, obviously it could be a mother or indeed a father or whoever within the household, is the, the, the person who's directly suffering domestic abuse, but it may well be that, uh, that their son or daughter is of, of working age and it's working again. For instance, they want to take some time off to be able to support, um, for example, their yeah. mother or father. You know, to take an, well, a good example would be, well, you know, they've, they've maybe finally persuaded their, their mother to, to leave their father and seek somewhere that, that's a refuge, but they want to be in a position where they're able to help them find somewhere and take some days off to be able to, to do that. I'm just wondering yeah. in terms of the way that the thing has been drafted, because again, part of the issue is for both the, the employee and the employer, you know, I appreciate maybe we don't want everything so tightly defined that that it doesn't cover different situations, but I suppose it would be important, I think, for both uh, the employee and also an employer knowing where to grant this, that there's a level of certainty, if you know what I mean, so that they, they, they can, yeah. they're not scratching their heads as to whether or not they qualify or not in relation to that. Yeah, I, th I think you make a very good point there about um, children of a working age um, who are the, the victims of domestic abuse. And we, we say children, but um, um, we, re we refer there, as I guess you mean people under 18 um, who um, are in employment. But then, but um, well, I think not, that's not, a couple not, not necessarily. You could get, for example, and I suppose depending upon, and I suppose you've seen even during the COVID, the housing market is, is such a way that, again, more and more um, younger people are effectively in a situation where they're still, they're not getting their own accommodation, even either rental, that they're maybe still staying in the, the parental home. So it could be, for the sake of argument, a 20-year-old um, living with parents who say in their, their 40s, for instance, and, you know, still, yeah. at, still at home and that, sure. and that basis on it. So. Yeah, well, well, a couple of things there. Um, obviously, the the under the the um, the bill, the twenty year old who is in employment, um, who possibly is a worker, say an agency worker and not an employee, um, it would be able to claim um, this leave. 
um, and this paid leave. So that's one issue. Um, but I think what you what you're possibly alluding to is the um, the, the position of the parent uh, in that position who would like to support um, the or, or or vice versa. Or vice versa. Yes. Uh, well, well, that that I think my answer to that would be that the the regulations to be brought forward by by the department could imp could obviously include uh, a reference to residential um, or household um, abuse. So I, th I think the, the the bill sponsor made that definition or that that um, that provision, if you like particularly broad to encompass things like that um um you know like the things you that you you discuss mr weir so i, I think that um that really would be again a, a something for the department to look at in the regulations um and i think there is there's possibly a reason f why the um the bill sponsor chose to go down that route rather than to be too over -prescri prescriptive um with the definitions I suppose the second bit I just want to pose on maybe a different area um, is um, we're aware, and I think probably what is being suggested in terms of global figures are not that large. We're aware of the uh, you've highlighted the uh, the particular financial implications of from the department's point of view producing the report uh, side of things, and maybe this is maybe this is something we just need to probe with the department. But also, I like to that um, whether there's been any consideration of to be able to, to gather the information in, will that require any additional uh, legislative changes to give the department power to, you know, in terms of seeking particular bits of information, particularly if we're talking about within the, the private sector, um, you know, what, whether there's any changes in relation to that. Maybe, maybe that's maybe something best that the department comments on, but I don't know, again, if you have any thoughts in relation to that yeah. as well. Yeah, well, I think that is a very good point, and, and clearly that would be a question for the department. But in terms of um, the provision for notice um, and, uh, and other confidentiality issues, I mean, they, that may um, require additional resources um, that that need to be looked at by the department. You're quite right um, in order to um, uh, to provide, if you like, confidentiality, um, record keeping, um, things like that may need a, a new, if you like, bespoke system to be um, to be um, deployed. So again, clearly that would be something for the department to um, to estimate a costing on. Um, but yes, I would see some um, additional resources be, to be required in that area. Possibly not a huge amount. Um, uh, existing resources are there. There are there is um, a family um, a unit, I think, in the Department of the Economy who deal with other statutory issues, statutory paid leave issues. Um, so I think the infrastructure is already there in the department. But again, <laughs> you would need to bring that up with the department whenever they come to see you. Final, final point, I suppose, uh, just on the parity issue. I suppose there's two aspects to this. Um, there's kind of the, the wider parity issue, which I know both the Chair and Mike had raised, which is, if we go down a particular route, what is the, call it the level of threat to the wider sort of block grant um, situation? Uh, and I suppose where there's a little bit of a, a chicken and egg uh, scenario, obviously Mike could raise the issue that, that, that um, probably is not, there may not be a worked example of where Treasury has stepped in to, um, uh, to make a particular financial requirement of, of devolved institutions. But I suppose then the issue is to what extent has actually in the devolved institutions directly parity been broken with that, you know, to what extent there could be a worked example of that. Um, and I suppose there's then, as he, as he indicated, the issue of whether, if that was the case, whether that would be something that would simply fall administratively to uh, to Treasury to potentially, you know, irrespective of what the, the ultimate policy decision taken on, whether that would require additional legislation or not. Um, now, I suppose the only point I would make in terms of parity, I think, where we also, from a point of view of principle, have got to be careful of, because this was something that was mooted a few years ago, maybe making this more as a point than a question, um, was if there is widespread acceptance of breaches of parity, uh, then I know, for instance, one of the things that was mooted um, back, I suppose, maybe roughly about eight or nine years ago, was the prospect of saying, well, actually, things like, for example, levels of benefits should reflect the 
much more be tied in with the local economic circumstances and the argument used that, for example, if the average level of wages in a region was, was less, then perhaps the benefits should be less. So we just got a little bit careful that those who would perhaps seek to go down that route, that we don't give them a, some level of, of route to do that. I suppose the final point of whether it's for yourselves or for the committee, um, I suppose, I, again, and maybe, maybe I don't want to, don't want to accuse the, the, the chair of being in exactly the same position myself, but whether, whether we're being a little bit obtuse in relation to this, but the, uh, the chair mentioned, for instance, the, the situation of you have, for instance, somebody then who is getting that statutory pay. And I think one of the things that would be quite helpful in those circumstances, if, if we had almost a couple of worked examples of, of how that, you know, so that X is off for 10 days, X's employer would be normally paying them Y amount of money. Uh, how does, almost if you like for an individual, almost tracing how the money impacts on the, the system and almost looking at that micro level, we could then have a better understanding of extrapolating <coughs> and saying, well, actually that is an implication that the contact HMRC, HMRC takes such and such, you know, allowance to the thing. I think, I think if we got a couple of those in kind of like, almost like a worked example type situation, I think that that would actually be helpful for us to actually really crystallise our thoughts around that. And it may also be that if there are certain routes, which depending upon where we go um, on some of the party issues, um, may sort of crystallise the route that we, that we take. But again, I don't know if it's maybe for yourselves or whether for the committee, there's something could be, could be done on that basis. I, I think that would be helpful because again, I mean, I confess probably a similar position probably to the, the chair's initial, but I think just to get it crystallised in our mind as to almost what the flowchart of, of finance is on as to as it impacts in each individual case, I think would be helpful. But thank you, Chair. Thanks, Peter. Um, Stuart, sorry. All right, Chair, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for, for, for the information which you've given us and for the very helpful report. Um, you made reference early on about the area around definition of domestic abuse um, uh, in legislation and, and how uh, that might be uh, determined in this bill. Um, and can I add to that, um, there are issues of both, um, in addition to domestic abuse, there are, there are other issues that arise in similar circumstances, for example, uh, sexual assault. Um, and, and there's another one um, where there's a high degree of, of, of information. British Crime Survey indicates that 29% uh, of people who are in abusive relationships are also stalked. So uh, is there a crossover with stalking legislation here? And, and can that or should that be included in, in definitions? It's, I think it's important that we have a clear understanding of what uh, domestic abuse is uh, in its widest context um, and that there's no, if the bill were to come into, into force, that there's no wriggle room for employers to say, well, that bit's not covered by, by, by uh, your request for leave. One other aspect just, um, that I want to raise with you is that when we were taking evidence from the bill sponsor, I, I raised the issue of confidentiality with employers. Uh, obviously, employers, particularly HR departments, will have uh, a high degree of confidence around their HR records, but potentially small employers, um, or, or indeed any employer, runs the risk of what might be described as water cooler conversations, and it's vitally important that the person seeking the leave ha has absolute assurance uh, of confidentiality of information that's given to their employer, and, and how or could that be included in the legislation? Okay, I, um, if, if, uh, with your permission, I'll, I'll address the second point first. Um, Chair, uh, in, in terms of confidentiality, um, I think it's very difficult um, to legislate per se, but it can be done. Um, I know in Australia, um, there is, um, in the Fair Act, um, for a work act in Australia, they do um, explicitly state that the uh, employer must pay regard um, to ensure information um, concerning um, notification and proof of domestic abuse is uh, treated confidentially. So that's explicitly um, in the uh, Australian legislation. Now, going through the other um, 
in the comparative perspective section um, that, that we that we did. There isn't really a um, any other uh, examples of um, explicit statutory provision uh, regarding confidentiality. Um, however, there are some things in the legislation. For example, in Ontario, the um, the employer um, in the legislation must keep the records uh, relating to the domestic abuse um, request for three years. Um, now, that's not necessarily a point about confidentiality, but um, if that um, provision, if you kind of think through that provision, then it'd be very simple for, for us to introduce something where the employer has to keep the records for three years and then perhaps dispose of the records. Um, again, you, you could possibly take advice on that. So that would possibly help with the confidentiality. But I think it'll be very difficult to legislate in terms of confidentiality because as you rightly say, um, that you know, you'll always will get those uh, water cooler moments and people will always gossip. So I think it's going to be very, very difficult. But um, as I say, Australia have explicitly, um, uh, explicitly have a, a provision in there with confidentiality on employers. So that's something that we definitely can't do. Could, could, um, that, be, could, that, I, be a, could that be a criminal defence uh, uh, offence or, or indeed could, could disclosing that information um, would, would, would that well, yeah, yeah. Would, you, it, there's two aspects to it. One is one is obviously uh, employers have their standards and their rules around how they maintain their employee records, um, but also this is putting the individual at a high degree of risk if that information as to the reasoning as to why the person uh, has sought to leave and could lead to a further incident for them. Uh, um, potentially life-threatening incidents if information, say, where they were living or something like that, got out. Um, so I, I am concerned that we need to be making it clear to employers the need for confidentiality, and we need also to be looking in the, in the direction of the person who's, who's making the request to ensure that they're adequately protected. Because... Yeah, yeah sorry. Just because... Um, the more people who know, the more difficult it all becomes. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I, I don't see any reason why we, the, um, there couldn't be some provision um, that would make that an, an offence. It would certainly give um, more teeth to the um, confidentiality aspects. But again, that's something that um, I'm not sure if that could be done through the, re the regulation, the way that this bill is actually set up, or it could be um, introduced by an amendment, an amendment by, uh, by the committee. Um, that's something that uh, you would need to talk through, perhaps with the legal team um, in the assembly, and take advice on that. But but yes, certainly, um, I can't think of any reason why um, uh, you couldn't do it um, per se. So um, I'm just going to go back to to your previous point. If if, if you're happy enough with the Thank the answers. Yeah. Um, the in terms of stalking and the definitional aspects of um, domestic abuse, the I think well, well, a couple of things to note. Um, I, I think the the bill sponsor was in the committee that in the justice committee whenever the domestic abuse civil proceedings act was going through. Um, so she would be very familiar with the definitional aspects of that particular act and that particular legislation. So clearly she's happy enough with it. Um, but in terms of stalking, I know there is legislation going through at the moment in stalking. Now, I could be wrong, but I think um, Reyes has produced some papers on um, stalking per se. So that might be worth um, maybe the, the uh, chair or, or the clerk speaking to the um, uh, Justice Committee on stalking to, and to see whether or not stalking, I mean, I, I don't know, I'm not um, an expert in this area, whether or not stalking is um, included. Um, the behaviour of stalking, would, you see that the, the um, domestic abuse um, uh, civil protections uh, act, it, it speaks about behaviours. So stalking could be covered, I think, but I'm not 100% sure. So that's something um, that you would need to, to clarify perhaps with the Justice Committee or, um, uh, or even the Justice Department. Okay, that, that, that's helpful because I think it is, it's important that we 
capture all of the potential um, issues around the, 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 the broadest definition of domestic abuse and on a spin-off from domestic abuse regrettably is and can be and there's there's good statistical evidence around it in that it can lead to stalking if that if that isn't sort of drawn into the broad definition of uh, domestic abuse then I <coughs> we do need to seek further information around that. I hope if, if I may add to that, I think stalking is a very good example um, because clearly the definition of domestic abuse is <laughs> um, a, a, a definition of the behaviour, but also a connection to the um, to, to the the victim. Yes. Um, a domestic and stalking wouldn't necessarily have that. So um, I, I see your point. So the um, so that would it would need to be looked at. Yes. Okay, thanks, Chair, and thank you, Michael, Orla, and Neve for your information so far. I just have one question, although I always say that it turns into two or three. But, <laughs> uh, my question relates to other countries, uh, Michael, or Orla, or Neve, whoever wants to ask. If you look at, at the start of your presentation, you referred to 31,196 incidents in 2020, 2021, and then 19,036 crimes. Okay, so if you look at that, for example, and I appreciate you mightn't have this information, but your sense on it, Michael, or whoever, in Italy, there's only uh, fewer than 100 women took up the benefit of it, okay? So what's that in correlation, if you, you know, how many incidences are in Italy, Canada, Philippines, based on how many women or men took, took up the benefit of it? You know where I'm coming from? So is there a, yeah. is there a, is there a, is there a, a broad percentage, Michael, of, of take up, if that makes sense? Yeah, well, I can I can answer that, uh, and um, in in terms of the Philippines uh, and Italy, that those are both very very interesting examples that you raised there. Um, in the Philippines, the domestic abuse leave is only available to women, yeah. and and the women must prove uh, by certificate that uh, the abuse has happened. So clearly, that's a barrier um, uh, to take up. So clearly, there are issues. Um, in, in that particular jurisdiction that um, I'd say would act as a barrier to people taking up uh, this leave. Clearly it doesn't apply to men and also the very fact that you have to produce a certificate um, would would act as, as a barrier to take up. Um, in, in Italy, um, there's a, uh, again, there are other issues um, behind the, the legislation that that proved bar a barrier to the um, the take overall take up. The system is very different in Italy. There are different um, types of of ways that you can actually take um, take the domestic abuse leave. You can actually go on a program if you like. I think that's the best way of describing it. Um, and so that if um, joining that program then gives you access to the domestic leave provision, but. You have to remember, if you when we think about um, confidentiality and all of these other issues, um, joining that program um, in itself would would appear to be a barrier, and that's one of the things that has was raised in the uh, in the in the research on the poor take up of the leave in Italy. Um, so all of these barriers um, we we need to be very very um, cognizant of um, in take up. Now, in terms of actual domestic abuse, you know, is it a Northern Ireland problem? Which perhaps the start of your question was raised. I mean, I, clearly it's it's not. It's it's a global issue. Now we didn't we don't have figures per se on how how many a domestic abuse incidents are in X, Y, and Z countries because they would be recorded in very different ways. And the stats you could be comparing apples and oranges, perhaps. So the statistics might not be um, uh, of equivalence, if, if if you like. But but I think certainly it is it is a it, it is a uh, from what I've read, and I don't know whether all or Neve would like to add to this, but it certainly seemed to be a glowing, uh, sorry, a growing. Um, Issue and it's also been exacerbated by lockdowns and COVID nineteen. So, so clearly the, uh, there is a, an issue to be addressed. Okay. Um. Do you see this, a uh, Michael or Orla? Do you see the bill in front of us? Do you see any barriers within it for for safely for women, men, or whoever needs it? Do you, you know? Is there any barriers in it? Um, I, I would say um, that I think the, the bill sponsor left 
the the legislation on the bill, as I said, um, the, the deliberately broad, um, so that there would be um, there wouldn't be uh, any barrier. The only the only barrier, only uh, issue is the is the financials and the party issue that I can see. That that would be um, um, perhaps a potential issue, a major issue, so we say going forward. Um, the uh, I think th that's that, that's from my perspective. I don't know if all or any would have anything else to say in terms of the the rights or um, equality issues. No, I think that the the bill itself is actually enhancing human rights protections for all domestic abuse um, victims and survivors, um, and. That wide definitional um, element of it as well would cover some of those things, maybe in terms of stalking that you talked about earlier on, by leaving it um, open to interpretation um, that might ensure that more people are covered with the, you know, within the bill and the scope of the bill than left unexcluded. Okay, and just one other point, maybe for the chair or, or Peter, in regard. It's interesting to know numbers in other countries of incidents on domestic abuse. And then take up just to give us a flavour, uh, and obviously appreciate your answer, um, Michael, in regard to you know barriers, and obviously uh, you know that's there doesn't need to be barriers, obviously. So, but it'd just be interesting to see what those other countries is like, uh, in reflection of our own country, whether it's incidents or a you know actual incidents or crimes. And then I suppose just following on, it's maybe a more a comment than a question, with regard to Peter's point. Is an incident, an incident would still be classed as, you know, a, a, a victim, is it still under an incident or whether it's a crime? What's your thought on that? So, you know, if you looked at those figures, an incident of domestic abuse, whether it's a crime or an incident, is still domestic abuse and still creates a victim. Is that, would that be your understanding, Michael? It would be. Um, now, I, you're speaking about the PSNI um, statistics there, and they do explain the differences between an incident and, and a crime um, in their um, in their bulletin. Um, but, but yes, I, I think the again we would use the in the, for this bill we would be using the definition of domestic abuse, which doesn't um, which doesn't affect mean that a crime has to has to have occurred. You know, um, a, a domestic abuse incident would uh, be evidence of domestic abuse, and therefore would be okay in the bill. Okay, thank you, thank, thanks, Michael and Orlin Eve, and thank you, Chair. Thank you, um, Keith. I don't have anybody else signalling to come in here at the minute. Um, so look, thank you for the briefing and, and you've given us, as always, um, a number of points that we'll be following up on and we can um, pick up some of those, those queries that members have raised as well. Um, and we might come back to you on some of that, if that's okay too. Sure, just on... Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Do you want to... I do, just, just on the back of, of Keith's one, if there is, for instance, a statistical table that's being produced in terms of with the number of incidents, um, crimes, crimes, uh, and then the take-up. But probably if that's done in a tabular form of some description, one of the things I would suggest maybe as well might be useful, because it'd be interesting to see um, whether in terms of take-up has been, whether it's a particular, I mean, I understand that there's a very good argument, and I think it, it probably will be the case, whatever, as to whether or not there's been a level of deterrence if in particular jurisdictions there's been evidence required to be able to trigger yeah. so you know if for the sake of argument um in some bits it's you know one percent take up but it's maybe a different jurisdiction maybe whether uh, where it can be a notification system maybe there'd be a higher take up but i think it'd just be interesting to see where um if we if it's just as part of that we almost had a you know a final column basically saying you know is it is specific evidence or detail of a crime required to trigger it or something of that nature just as, as part of the same Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, we'll move on now to our, our next brief. And Peter, is there anything we need to? Or will we do it all we, then? We follow up. Yeah. Chair. We follow up. Okay. Thank you. So we're moving on then to our next um, briefing. Yeah, we have both our witnesses there. Um, so item number five on our agenda, which is also um, a briefing on the domestic abuse safe leave bill from Women's Aid Federation. There is a clerk's memo at page 53 of our packs, and then there's an updated memo at page 4 of table papers. So if I could um, welcome to this morning's meeting then Sonia McMullen, who is Regional Service Manager at Women's Aid, 
and Rhonda Lusty, who is the coordinator at Men's Advisory Project. So I hand over to yourselves, first of all, to make an opening statement, and then we can open it up to, to members for questions. Um, good morning. Rhonda, do you want me to go first? I can go for kind of to follow you. Go can everyone hear me then? Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to present to you today, Chair, and the Economy Committee in relation to the Domestic um, Abuse Safe Leave Bill. I am Sonia McMullen, as you've already said, and I'll be speaking on behalf of our eight local women's aid groups across Northern Ireland today. And of course, we hope to portray the voices of those women, um, children, and young people in this session. The Safe Leave Bill is a vital piece of legislation that, if passed, will help give extra protection to all victims and survivors of domestic abuse through allowing individuals to have time needed to help support them at a point of crisis within their lives. It will also inform workplaces, we hope, and give them an opportunity to engage in the development of workplace domestic abuse policies and be better informed around the impacts and be able to look out for the signs and symptoms of domestic abuse. This piece of legislation would offer protection and that time and space that people need for reflection whenever they're experiencing any form of trauma, but especially domestic abuse. Our response is informed by supporting women, children, young people over 40 years here in Northern Ireland, many of which would have really benefited from this piece of legislation, allowing them to continue in the workplace and also have greater financial freedom and choices to make decisions, which often that disposable income within the workplace brings. In the last year, Women's Aid has supported over 6,000 families, and I'm interested in the conversation you're having around the incidents and the crimes and the prevalence of domestic abuse in Northern Ireland. Indeed, our police statistics that we have are the highest from that data set began in 2004-2005. We also know that about 50% of the women that would come to Women's Aid actually never report to the police. So it's very difficult to have an accurate figure in relation to the amount of families are affected by domestic abuse in Northern Ireland. But if we look at those other regions, I just picked that up while you're having your conversation. In England and Wales, there's 14 incidents per thousand people in the population in relation to domestic abuse incidents. In Scotland, it's 11 incidents per thousand and in Northern Ireland it's 16 incidents per thousand in the last police bulletin for the last financial year so equating to a fifth of all crime recorded here in Northern Ireland and of course we know that the data is collected in different ways but just for your information after you know you pointed that out though the stark statistic for us during the last year especially from the 23rd of March 2020 to the 23rd of March 2021 was that eight women have been murdered. And this is the reality of domestic abuse in Northern Ireland. The reality that without investment in services, early intervention and prevention, domestic abuse kills. And again, we have the highest rates of femicide in Europe where someone has been murdered, where there's a domestic motivation by a family member or a partner. And you've already you know, discussed the domestic abuse incidents that the police are attending an incident every 17 minutes here in Northern Ireland. So it definitely is a problem that is not going away. And it affects people's lives in so many different ways. It affects families and it really limits people's opportunities, including their employment opportunities. It comes in many forms and you've been discussing the new legislation around the coercive control legislation for coercive and controlling behaviour, which will go live in February 2022. And just to equate that, you know, I know the economy, that your particular committee don't probably look at the minutia of all the legislation that's going through the Assembly all of the time, um, but this legislation was live in England and Wales in 2015. In the south in 2019 you know we're really falling behind here and we have a lot of catching up to do but we of course welcome that legislation we were involved in the process of that and you know cursive control is a form of abuse that is not recognized all of the time and we don't always see the impact of this behavior on women in the workplace 
For some people, work is a safe place, like a sanctuary, like schools that we've seen and heard a lot about in the last few weeks, um, especially during um, COVID. But for some people, they need to take time off to cope with the mental stress and anxiety that domestic abuse causes and contributes to, as well as physical abuse, which can, of course, impact on the ability for some people to function and simply carry out you know, their day-to-day -day roles and tasks. There are many factors to take into consideration in relation to, to this piece of work, including the loss of productivity in the workplace when an individual experiences domestic abuse. But we would direct the committee to a piece of research and we've just submitted, sorry it was a bit late, but um, a, a briefing paper for you there this morning and it references the economic and social costs of crime paper and that outlines the impact of domestic abuse in the workplace but also highlights that these crimes disproportionately affect women and girls who are often in part-time lower paid employment as well and it's important to recognise that when considering the bill, the gendered nature of domestic abuse. And within the police statistics, we've we've run to here today, you know, from Matt, who will talk about men um, as victims and survivors. But 69% of all domestic abuse crimes were female and 31% were male. But of all the offenders dealt with the PSNI in 2021 in connection with domestic abuse crimes, 86% of the offenders were male and 13% were female. If we look at ICTU's recent research into domestic abuse in the workplace, a really good piece of work um, which took place in Northern Ireland, the survey was completed by 1,734 people and 82% of those respondents were women and a third of them had experienced domestic abuse in the workplace. So quite staggering statistics there. Women said we know and we speak to women day in day out that are trying to maintain their employment. Lots of women within our refuges are still trying to work, keep everything together. Uh, you know, they need financial security for themselves and their family, and work is really important. But again, productivity can be reduced during these periods of long-term stress and anxiety, including experiencing and living in a home where you're experiencing abuse. Very difficult to concentrate when you're experiencing any form of stress or have been affected by trauma. The issue isn't discussed enough, you know, widely in public awareness campaigns, the, the wider effect of domestic abuse and your ability to thrive and strive in, um, in any form of life. But employment prospects can really be hindered by taking time off at short notice, turning up late for work, taking lots of calls from partner. You were talking about stalking as well, huge correlation between stalking, domestic abuse and course of control and some people are unable to get to their place of work due to physical injury or being restrained so also child care you know people refusing to help them with child care for example so therefore they can have unexpected absences can lead to disciplinary action if the employer is unaware of the situation but it's extremely difficult to disclose domestic abuse. You know, domestic violence and abuse is shrouded in guilt and secrecy and shame. And for so many people, they find it so difficult to even disclose to a family member or friend. So to be able to disclose to an employer, well, I'm sure the committee can, you know, realize how impactful and how difficult that can be for someone to do. And it takes a very good employer with a really good skill set of empathy and understanding to be able to do that as well. So that's why we're really pushing on those workplace policies. And we welcome the introduction by organisations such as Danske Bank, who have already implemented the paid leave um, here in Northern Ireland through a workplace policy on domestic abuse. But it is a very common occurrence where the perpetrator will want the victim or survivor to rely on them for money as well. And then again, that's reducing your independence, your space for action through having your own financial security or any dispos disposable income. Financial abuse is a huge issue on its own in relation to domestic abuse and especially in relation to court proceedings, for example, we did a, a very short desktop piece of research around that and a huge amount of people are in a, a lot of debt from um, court fees alone. So financial limitations can create more isolation and dependency. So the perpetrator can, of course, gain more control. 
We welcome the opportunity to address a committee that we normally wouldn't engage with. We're normally in front of the Justice Committee quite a lot, as you can imagine, over the last number of years with the amount of legislation that's going through. But domestic abuse is a problem that crosses all departments and doesn't fall just within Health and Justice, who draft and look after the current domestic and sexual abuse strategy. So we call on all government departments to take ownership of all the key issues because without your support, no reforms to domestic abuse will work. It's paramount that our housing departments, health departments, education, economy, and all departments take part in making this work move forward and transform the lives of those experiencing domestic abuse. But just for the committee's reference in relation to costing, if we look at the most recent strategy to stopping domestic and sexual abuse in Northern Ireland. It's running from 2013 to 20, so it's being reviewed at the moment. But in 2016, the cost of domestic and sexual violence in Northern Ireland was estimated at 931 million. And women's aid service provision at those current levels was less than 1% of the total cost. So we develop, you know, we welcome all of the developments that are currently taking place within that legislative framework. Um, legislation currently ongoing is the Justice Sexual Offences and Human Trafficking Bill to include upskirt and down blouse and rough sex defence, image based violence, breach of trust and the other provisions around Gillen and those recommendations around serious sexual offences, non fatal strangulation with regard to a specific offence. The stalking bill then is currently going through as well, and that is so needed, as you've already stated, and that would include stalking protection orders and notices. Domestic abuse protection orders and notices we need as well, because we focus on removing that family from that home, and we don't have the interventions to be able to remove that perpetrator at the moment around those emergency barring orders. And of course, the violence against women and girls strategy, which the executive office are now undertaking and we welcome that. So it shouldn't be a postcode lottery here in Northern Ireland, but currently it is. If I lived in London today and I experienced a domestic abuse incident, there's a lot more robust legal remedies that are open to me. But also if the police came to me this evening and there's a domestic abuse incident in my home, I have three kids, one of them still under 18. So there'd be an automatic referral to social services. Police might get involved. I might have to go to the housing executive to look at housing. I might want to get some orders out. So I'll have to go to the solicitor and then go to court. Education and welfare officer might be involved due to my children not attending school, etc., etc. And that's all of the appointments and um, you know that uh, a woman may have to undertake in that short time. Whenever you disclose this piece of abuse, it does open up a huge piece of work. So you can imagine the impact that that has in the workplace with regard to time off, just to be able to attend those, never mind the time and space that a person needs to be able to process and reflect what's going on. So any new legislation also needs sustainable funding. Um, to enable life-saving specialist services and to be able to respond. So that's another key issue that, that women say would like to raise as well. But we need to ensure that every victim and survivor gets the support that they need when they need it, that it's timely. And we can't afford to move further behind here in Northern Ireland. So thank you very much for the opportunity to present to you today. And I'm happy to take any questions, but of course I'll hand over to um, Rhonda. Thank you very much. Am I okay to speak or do you want a question first? No, no, go you ahead. And then we can bring okay. people in for questions. Sorry, Sonia, I said you were just going to say hi. Um, I want to thank the committee for asking the Women's Advisory Project to speak and give evidence today. Um, my name is Rhonda Lusty and I work for the Men's Advisory Project. We're a charity and we have been working in, across Northern Ireland for 22 years supporting men who have endured domestic abuse. Um, it's, it is right that we're not often in front of this committee. In fact, it's the front, first time we've been in front of this committee. Um, so perhaps it would be useful for us to give you some context of um, the numbers of men who face domestic abuse and some of the ways that that might happen. So as um, Sonia has told you, um, domestic abuse is obviously a huge crime. We had just over 20,000 crimes last year, um, but 31% of those happened to men. 
In 1920, three men lost their lives to domestic abuse, and in 2021, two men lost their lives to domestic abuse. And when we speak about domestic abuse, we very rarely speak about those men who've lost their lives. And we very, very rarely think about those men who are facing domestic abuse every day. Domestic abuse is a crime that is still not seen as something that happens to men. And when men are coming forward or are being looked at, when we're examining policies, when we're examining laws, and we're examining responses, very often men and their voices and their experience of domestic abuse is not gathered. So when we think of something like um, ICTA, it's an excellent piece of work, but also you have to wonder how men were encouraged to fill that in, and if those men even thought that what was happening to them was domestic abuse. And this is a real problem, and this is one of the reasons why something like a safe leave bill will be hugely supportive. It'll be hugely supportive because there are men who we hear who say that, I'm oh, sorry, forgive me, who say that, um, their only safe haven is work. And there are men who say that, um, sorry, sorry, <coughs> wrong my throat. So, and there are men who say that what has happened to them, it's the interesting thing is that work have never noticed. So whilst work may be their safe haven and work may be the only place where they can have to breathe or have space, additionally, work is somewhere where, where no one has noticed what has happened to them, although there's a clear pattern of abuse. So this isn't just something that could support people to safety and support people to be able to lead their lives free of domestic abuse. It's also a way in which we could build a community response to domestic abuse. If we started to say that the shame is on the abuser, if the questions no longer became something in which a person who faced abuse was ashamed about, ashamed about or that there was any worry or concern around. So it's more than just a safe leave bill. It really truly has to be, how do we make this, bring this truly into the light and make this truly about health and safety for those in the workplace as well. We know that domestic abuse is dangerous throughout the period of domestic abuse, but it is also dangerous post separation. And post separation is sometimes the time when people who have faced domestic abuse most need the support of a safe leave bill. As, as Sonia has pointed out, there are many, many different things that you might need to access as someone who's faced domestic abuse. But one of the things that you need, first of all, is space. Because if you think about it, you have been often violently attacked by someone you love. Someone you love, and very often, perhaps there are children in the house, very often. So it's that space and time to do what you need. First of all, to think about what you need, and then after that, to organize all these different appointments, how you might get housing, how you might get legal or police care, because also having police witness statements and things like that, none of these things are simple. I to speak earlier about when is it a domestic abuse incident or a domestic abuse crime. I don't think it really matters. Um, we hear that our statistics are so huge. So, sorry, we hear our statistics are so huge in Northern Ireland, but those statistics we need to be Honestly, the tip of an iceberg. Our, is everything, sorry. So those, those statistics are a tip of an iceberg and we regularly see men um, who have never been near the police but have been facing domestic abuse for many years, as Sonia would also say in Women's Aid. So we wish to thank Rachel Woods for bringing this forward. Um, we wanted to talk to you about one of the men that we've supported to try and give you some sort of flavour of what it might be like. Um, we spoke to some men prior to coming to um, give evidence and they were, one of them was happy for his story to be shared. Um, the thing that was um, typical about this case was that he had experienced um, really extensive abuse um, and physical abuse. In almost every domestically abusive relationship, there is control because without control, um, the abuse, the abusive patterns can't begin and there's control and isolation. If you remove someone's work from that person, it might be the very last life raft they have. This is why it is so vital that safe leave is provided to those who are in, a, in employment and that domestic abuse is seen as a health and safety issue. For this man who, who we supported, he faced violent abuse. Often that violent abuse was much worse at the weekend. Um, 
And so afterward, sometimes he couldn't come into work because he was marked or he was physically, really, really physically harmed. Now this man was well known to the police and had been through the MARAC process for those who are at highest risk. But his work didn't ever consider that perhaps he was a victim of domestic abuse. His work thought that he was someone who simply didn't turn up on some Mondays or some Mondays and Tuesdays. So eventually it came to the point when not only was he being violently abused, to the point where we were very concerned about him losing his life, but also he was at the point where he might have lost his job. He was at final warning. In his work, there were jokes made about him being um, you know, unreliable. In his work, there were jokes made about his sport and there were assumptions made. The thing is, we have to move away from assumptions. We have to move in the way and follow the light of somewhere like Danske Bank. We have to be able to be brave enough to ask questions. There is no shame on those who are being abused. The shame is on the abusers. But we must ask you to widen your lens so that you can see that domestic abuse, while it's terrible and happening to women and girls, as we can tell you and show you, demonstrate from police statistics and unfortunately deaths, this is also something that's impacting men and their families too. So we thank you so much for giving us this space and time to speak with you. But we must implore you to see that this is something that will benefit business. This is something that will benefit society. And better than that, this is something that we on this part of this island can lead the rest of these islands in. We should be bringing in safe leave to support the men, women and children who are facing abuse. This is absolutely, you know, the cost that you might think that there might be placed on small to medium sized employers does not weigh the same as the cost of life, the cost of anxiety, the cost of hope that we can be giving those who face abuse. I thank you so much for listening to me today and thank you, Sonia, for your, for your perfect and beautiful beginning. Thank you both very much for um, your, your briefings. They've been really, really helpful to us. I think you have very clearly set out the, the range of issues that victims of domestic abuse face, um, including you know, needing to access support, housing, police, legal support, um, and how all of those things can impact on um, someone's work life as well. Um, and just to say that the committee is very aware that um, domestic abuse can happen to anyone, regardless of sex or our class or background or, or anything else. And, and it's very important that we hear the, the full um, range of that. So obviously we, we wanted to ensure that uh, those witnesses that are briefing us uh, reflect that. So um, I don't have a great deal of questions because you have very um, well set out all of the issues. But just in from both of you, could I, I ask, are there anything that you believe are <coughs> missing from this bill? Are there any um, things that need to be uh, set out more clearly in respect of the bill? And we have received... Um, your briefing through there, Sonia, as well. So, um, and have, see some of the things that you've highlighted in relation to the flexibility and how leave is taken, etc. Mm -hmm. So, those are things that obviously we'll take in, into account as well. But if you could maybe just um, respond, both of you, to those those two questions. Um, can I? Are you okay, for Sonia? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think one of the things that I was hearing just before we got on. Um, was a little bit concerning to me. The idea that perhaps you would have had to have faced a crime before you would be able to avail of the leave. Uh, one of the things that's excellent about the bill is that it should start from first day of employment um, because that support needs to be there so that a person can stay safe and so that we might be able to save that person's lives or the lives of their children because the impact isn't just on the men and women, it's on whomever else is in the house, whether that's vulnerable others, or whether it's children. So um, we really we really like that, we really welcome that. The other thing we would be very fearful of is that um, when we consider when we consider the bill, that we only consider it being triggered by crime. Domestic abuse incidents are often experienced time and time and time again. Um, and as we've spoken, there is a great deal of difficulty in men often understanding that what is happening is domestic abuse. And again, we have a lot of work to do in society to bring men forward, um, to, you know, to, to allow those men to 
understand and be encouraged that this is domestic abuse and that they too can have the support of um, whether it's human resources or other areas of support within their organisation. So that, that needs to be something in which we, in, so we find it hard often for men to report domestic abuse, but additionally we find it hard often for them to put their hand up and say that it is domestic abuse. If we put barriers in front of that, we will prevent those who need support getting it. It should be something that is open to all and welcoming to all. And I know, again, that that might cause you fear, but this has to be for those who need the support. We have to not worry about, I think with everything, we worry about bad actors when we're creating law, but instead we should be thinking about positive action. And this really is a positive action and something that could be life-changing and life-saving. Sonia. Yes, Rhonda, totally um, agree with you. I suppose one of the things we would be concerned about is around the proof of the domestic abuse. For many people, they haven't told anyone, they haven't gone to a doctor, they haven't got a police report. You know, how do you prove that? So you'd be taking someone on their word and for someone to actually be able to disclose is going to be a very, very difficult thing. We know already that people go to a GP, they go to a &E, people are asked and they don't tell, you know, and sometimes it has to be asked quite directly, you know, are you safe at home? Is there anything going on? You want to talk to me about that kind of thing. So I think there's a whole piece of work around the workplace policy, around the training and awareness for all employers. I know that's very difficult for very small, you know, organisations, but you know, we had a phone call recently from an employer who was in a, a petrol station, um, quite a rural one, and one of his employees was experiencing domestic abuse, didn't know where to start with it, but lifted the phone and thought, you know, what do I need to do here? And, you know, sometimes that's all you need to do. It's about that trauma-informed approach about being present and available for that individual at that time. So. I think we welcome, there'll be a public awareness campaign, obviously, in the new year in relation to the new legislation, but it's about employers and the whole general public being informed about the level of domestic abuse we have, the high level we have. And because of the high levels that we do have, we know that it touches all of us, each and every one of us will know someone, a friend, a family, a colleague who has been affected at some point by domestic abuse. And that is a reality of it here in Northern Ireland. If we're going to tackle this at all, you know, we need to look at a, a wider um, picture and that information being relayed to employers is really, really important. So the proof is a difficult one um, to be able to to do. And I, I don't know how, you know, people could do that. Totally agree with Rhonda in relation to day one as well. And of course, the post separation, you know, domestic abuse does not end at the point of separation. And it could be five, 10, you know, people are in protracted legal proceedings for 10 years afterwards, you know, and there's still abuse going on as well. So that's an important consideration with regard to those time frames as well. Okay, thank you both for that. That's very helpful. And yeah, obviously the proof um, issue is one that has been raised with us and, and there's been some discussion and um, obviously we'll have to consider that in more detail as we continue. Um, but just to say, just to clarify on the issue around the, the, um, the crime aspect of it, I think that discussion was actually in relation to, to data. So um, within the bill, as my, I understand, it's set out as a domestic abuse incident. So it's not a case of somebody having to proceed through legal proceedings or, or criminal proceedings. I think it was um, a question around the data, but maybe those that were raised yeah. it will, will yeah. address that as well. Peter, you're up. Yeah, no, I mean, it's supposed to reiterate, I suppose, from the, the Chair's point of view, there will be around this and quite often in legislation we will probe things in terms of information and data and I suppose maybe stress test them. It doesn't necessarily mean that we are hostile to particular provisions, etc. I suppose can I also, I suppose as, maybe, as a member of the, uh, where my other hat as a member of the Justice Committee, I know that the many submissions obviously and, and evidence sessions that you've given have been very valuable in that and I thank you for your, your contribution today. I suppose I want to probe just two issues. Um, uh, and I suppose following on from the last point in terms of the issue uh, I think the point has been made very well about uh, the potential barriers there, that if there's an evidential basis or a proof basis that would be required to be able to act as a trigger point in relation to it. But uh, I suppose one of the, related to that, is there's always one of the, the balances that we're always trying to strike in terms of legislation is 
how much, particularly in this nature, should we be prescriptive from the start, and how much is effectively act as a sort of a paving mechanism that then can be sketched in at a later stage for, for regulations. And there's there's merits in both in relation to that. But specifically, um, your thoughts, I want to get your thoughts just on um, if the legislation goes through, for example, and there isn't any proof element of it, then it would be some form of notification process. And I just, uh, because clearly there will have to be obviously some form of record that will be kept in terms of where this is triggered so people can obtain their entitlements. So I just want to give, if you have any thoughts on uh, the detail of how you would see a notification process working. Um, and I suppose related to that, uh, and I know something Mr Dixon particularly has, has pushed as well, there is also then, there's a very, there's a great sensitivity around this issue, and I know you indicated as well, uh, the fact that, that there is at times a, both a reluctance of people sometimes to come forward, but a reluctance in terms of for things to be public knowledge, for example. Uh, your thoughts on also the sensitivity of how we ensure confidentiality of that, that triggering, because I suppose again, there can also be that situation that no that being a small place, suddenly somebody isn't there at work, you know, inevitably, even without even if things are kept very confidential, rumours will start quite often on that on that basis. So I just wonder in terms of the issue of both notification and confidentiality be the first issue and then maybe one other issue you just want to, to raise for yourselves. Okay, Bronte, do you want to? Do you want to go or do you want to? Um, no, go ahead. I okay. Um, uh, thank you for your questions. Um, Mr. Weir, I think um, the, for me, it's a really interesting um, question because, again, the, the first thing is we have to say we, we believe those who have faced abuse. So in the same way that if someone said to you, I need time off for a funeral, no one says, could you bring in a death certificate? We say, gosh, that's awful, of course. So if someone were to say, I need, I need some time off because, I mean, it doesn't have, you could say domestic abuse, you could say difficulties at home. You know, it can be whatever words that, and form of words that that department in, in your work use. Um, but again, we have to move away from this idea that there is shame around something that someone chooses to do on you. No one chooses domestic abuse. No one. They enter into relationships with an abuser and an abuser abuses them. They enter into that relationship with an open heart and with all the hopes that all the rest of us have. So this idea that there, would, there should be shame or that there should be gossip, I think that's something that we as society need to move from. So if someone told me, sir, that um, you were facing domestic abuse, it wouldn't be a gossip item for me. It would be an item of huge compassion if I were to hear that. And that's where we must move toward, that domestic abuse is not scurrilous. It is something that is life ending and it is something that is life limiting and that it is something where the shame is on the abuser. And if we were to openly shame abusers more in this way and start to recognise it in this way, we can start to tackle this problem. So we need your support and we need all department support to see it in that way. Um, the barriers in terms of proof basis, I, I just don't, I don't think we should be prescriptive in this area. I think it's something that all, I do believe all employers should be doing. So whether it's, as Sonia says, from, you know, that, that, brilliant, that brilliant person phoning from um, a small garage trying to support someone to the larger workforces, it shouldn't be that if you work for a small employer, you get less protection. It should be that every employer offers this and offers it freely and steps forward to do so. So obviously I'm going to say that, but that's what I truly believe. That's on you. Yes, couldn't agree with Rhonda more, you know, in relation to the comments, but we do realise um, in the implementation of such a piece of legislation, these are some of the challenges that we will face um, moving forward. I think with regard to the notification, of course, in bigger companies, you may have domestic abuse champions and that kind of thing, or welfare officers that people can disclose to in confidence. There is a huge issue around confidentiality in relation to these 
this pace and this sharing of this information. So it would have to be done in such a way that people feel confident because for so many people, when they do disclose their information is used further and it puts them back so much in their whole support and recovery and that pathway to support. So we have to be very mindful of that. And as Rhonda said as well, there's been so much publicly over the last few weeks about believing survivors and the importance. The sooner you're believed, the sooner you start to heal. And we hear that so much. That first response is so important. So if someone does disclose to an employer, it has to be done in the right way. They have to know those pathways to support and what is available for them then to move them. They're not going to have to go into a counselling session, but just to know the phone number, to know where to go and what they can do to help support them. But confidentiality is key in relation to that piece for um, absolutely everyone. So for bigger human resource departments within you know local government and everything it's it's maybe easier you know when they have be able to have those kind of champions we've worked with a few corporates recently who have allocated those champions and disclosures have happened and really successfully because they've had the training and awareness sessions with us before and and you know that's working really really well and they're putting in place what they can do but like early intervention is key to all of this and any domestic abuse work, any strategy, any forward planning and working. And to be able to give people time off at that earlier point, it actually will save the employer in the long run. It's like our government investing now. If you all invest much more now in all of these services, you will save money in the criminal justice and the health budget for further down the line as well. Yeah, no, I think, I mean, just, to, just for in case there's any doubt in relation to the issue, I suppose on the, on the two points, in terms of, I'm not suggesting that there is or should be any form of, of shame in, in relation to that. I suppose what I'm saying is, I'm maybe echoing your points in terms of confidentiality in connection yeah. with that. Uh, and I'm conscious of the fact that, that uh, we need to have protective mechanisms in place um, because there will also be, particularly from the point of view of confidentiality, there will be some people who will want to be very open and publicly expressive about things. Others will actually want to be able to avail of services, but will want to keep everything as as, uh, as sort of well protected and as quiet as, as as possible in that regard. And I think we need to respect uh, both positions in, in relation to that. And again, uh, as with a lot of things in any form of workplace, it should be in a position where, where people aren't subject to levels of speculation or gossip. But unfortunately, sometimes that, that will happen. So we need just to think how also actually we can protect the position and protect that relationship between employer and employee. And I suppose similarly in terms of, um, I think the points are made well in terms of the issue of proof, uh, but we do need, I think, um, and again, it's to make sure that there aren't barriers to people. So we need, we need in terms of whatever the practical mechanisms are, because if, if we're talking about statutory entitlement, then there will have to be something, whatever the format, will have to be something that, that is, officially triggered on that on that basis so you know we need actually i think again for um, the victims of domestic abuse that they have a very clear-cut pathway that it's not something that, that is relatively vague as to how things are being triggered that it is something that is, is clear-cut on that basis then we just want to touch then just on one final point to get your your professional judgment um when we talk when statistics are rolled out in terms of uh, criminal incidents, what is reported, there's always a slightly double-edged sword when it comes to rises or falls in those figures because either a rise or a fall in, I mean, whether it's on the basis of domestic abuse or, or any other crime, where we see an increase in, in numbers or a decrease in numbers, that can either reflect where there's greater incidence of a crime or lesser incidence depending whether they're rising or falling, but it can also reflect whether there's, um, sometimes if there's an increase in numbers that can reflect um, a greater confidence that, that, uh, and a willingness in people to come forward and on the flip side of the coin if we see a reduction in terms of figures that sometimes doesn't necessarily mean that there's less of that crime taking place it may be that there's a breakdown in terms of people feeling well what's the point of reporting this i won't have anything done about it so you know the, the statistics themselves can be a little bit of a movable feast where there's up and down sort of thing 
one of the issues was in terms of the, the implications uh, in relation and to again seek your professional judgment in terms of experience on, on the basis that um, if I suppose in terms of the, the, the current provisions then they become law <coughs> what's your what's your views on the, the level of uptake that this will uh, this will lead to in terms of those who are revealing of this I know I appreciate that's you're casting into sort of a slight level of unknown, but I'd be interested just to get your, your views on the level, because obviously there will be quite a lot of people who will suffer from domestic abuse um, who will either not feel of this or perhaps feel that, uh, that in terms of the time off wouldn't be the particular route that they wish to take or whatever. So I just, I just want your thought on where you see from a practical point of view the, the levels of uptake uh, if the legislation of, a, of either this or a very similar nature then goes through. If I could just come in there first, I think the key to this will be the awareness of it. How do we get that information out that this is available if this is passed into legislation? How does everybody know in the public in Northern Ireland that there is a safe leave bill and this is something that is available to them? Many people do not know, uh, for example, whenever the legal aid waiver came on in, in relation to uh, protection orders, you know, there's so many people just didn't know it existed and couldn't avail of it. So it's awareness like anything, you know, how do we promote this? Do you promote this? What what way will it be, be rolled out within the, the workplace for, for those people? Will it be through, you know, unions and, and that kind of awareness raising? I just wonder because there'll be a lot of people that just won't know anything about it and be aware of it like so many other things you know pieces of legislation go through and people just don't know you know because they're not in the sector they don't know and they don't know until they need it sometimes you know so there'll be a lot of people will not be aware that they're you know that is in it is in existence and that's a big problem for us in so many relation to so many things okay thanks um, Sorry, um, can I just, um, excellent as always, Sonia, um, can I just come back to one of the things that you had said? Um, when when we speak about this, I understand, of course, um, your point about confidentiality. I deal every day with men who've experienced abuse. And one of the things that prevent those men most from um, coming forward, seeking help, is shame. I mean, it's shame is the greatest barrier. And, and I know... Um, that the gendered experience of men who've experienced abuse might be slightly different than that of which women experience abuse. The excellent work of Women's Aid over, over 40 years may have brought the experiences of, of women and children to the fore in a way that the experiences of men and their children have not been brought to the fore. So we are battling each day with men so that they can sit with the shame that they feel that someone has abused them. So I think your point was a really good one and really well made. I, 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 I'm not disputing that. But I think what I'm saying is we have to make an effort to move through and past that. And we have to, like Sonia says, with this bill, if we're going to use it, we have to say why we're using it. We have to celebrate it. And we have to talk about how we as a country are stepping away from a country that tolerates abuse. So the statistics and whether they go up and down, we would agree that... Um, that actually when we see statistics go up, we probably feel that that's because more people are aware that support is out there for them and that there might be a greater awareness of how well the police are doing and how much confidence there is in police. But again, these statistics are a tiny, tiny percentage of what's really going on. And when you think about it and how horrifying it is, I mean, it, you know, it's, it, it is truly horrifying, but, um, you know, it, it is that point of, and, and when we're talking about proof also, and we're talking about shame within the workplace, there is a difficulty, and the difficulty might be, additionally, that not everyone may have all of their status out in the workplace, and this is something we'd wanted to speak about. So not everyone might be open about their sexuality in the workplace, or might be open about their, even their relationship status at all. They may never have spoken about what goes on at home. So again, when we speak about barriers, there are intersecting barriers. So the barriers might be that the person's very, you know, very rural, very isolated. It might be intersected by they're also um, uh, they're they're also gay, bi or trans or lesbian. You know, it may be that they're older, younger. We have to look at these intersecting things that prevent people from getting the help and support that they need. 
But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't do it and that we shouldn't step forward positively to do it. No, thanks for that. Um, Stephen, you're up next. Okay, thank you, Chair, and thanks, Sonia and Rhonda, for your presentation, which was very clear in your engagement so far. Certainly, I would join with others commending the work that you do, including within Mo North Down constituency, which I'm aware of, of your activities in, in, in both um, organisations. Obviously, as you said, it, it is becoming more widespread and it's been growing in, in recent years. Just to, um, specifically in terms of this bill, I would be keen for your opinion in terms of the. Obviously, we've seen a great increase in working from home um, since the pandemic started coming up two years ago. Um, have you noticed, you know, has, do you think that has brought an increased um, demand on your services? Obviously, um, for some, the workplace is actually a safer place than home. So just be interested in your views on that in terms of the, that working from home issue. Um, certainly, women say it have seen, uh, I suppose, you know, we have to be clear that the pandemic hasn't caused domestic abuse. It's always been there. But of course, whenever we have government messaging saying stay home, stay safe, whenever we know that many families living day and daily with domestic abuse. So we saw similar to safeguarding figures, a decrease in referrals whenever the first lockdown started. Whenever there was any sort of lessening of any restrictions, we seen our referrals go up. And that's why last year on the 25th of November, as part of the 16 days of action, we started our Unlock Your Lockdown campaign. And that was really to let people know, you know, we're still open, we're still here, please contact us. And a lot of the work we did with safety planning around being at home, you know, looking at very simple safety planning around keywords for uh, friends and families if you know they weren't safe and also we saw a lot of the financial abuse implications where families maybe went to grandparents for dinner and that kind of thing you know and just didn't uh, have those financial implications were really impacted upon as well so it's been a very very difficult year for all families who are experiencing domestic abuse we're really happy that our services have gone back you know face to face and we hope they stay that way albeit there may be a few changes on the horizon, but there was an awful lot of risk assessment. Risk assessment is very fluid and it's changing all the time. So we were supporting families that were still living with domestic abuse, but of course then other families that were, were out of the situation. So certainly the working at home message, as you say, you know, and we said within our submission that home as well as school and college and all of those places, places are often a safe haven for people. So working at home, we actually got contacted by an awful lot of employers. Um, the Financial Services Union, for example, that covers the whole island, of, um, um, they contacted us as they seen an increase in domestic abuse and wanted to know how they could help all of their members. And that was really successful. And we did a, a group of webinars <coughs> and looking at the champions within different organizations and obviously then the North, the Danske Bank as well promoted that too so there's been an awful lot of organizations contacting us looking at their workplace policies and raising the profile of this work during the last year and a half or coming up to two years which we welcome but it's about the support services that can't meet the need because of the lack of funding as well and those waiting lists that are that are um being extended across the whole country in relation to support services. If you ring someone and you need support, you don't want to be put in a waiting list. It might put you, you further back again as well. So it certainly has impacted most definitely on the lives and the safety of many families living here in Northern Ireland. It's a perfect storm for perpetrators of domestic abuse. If we think of our language around isolation, and many of the things that are happening um, during COVID and those restrictions are tactics that are already used by um, many perpetrators. So yeah, it culminated in a perfect storm for them, but um, raised very serious safety issues for many families. But uh, most of our refuges were full and still are very high levels of occupancy and a huge amount of referrals coming through day and daily as I know MAP are experiencing as well. Okay, thank um, you. Yeah, so um, from MAP's point of view, um, 
we are we became a crisis and you know a crisis response during COVID. So that meant that we were open 365 days a year, and we were working up until 10 o'clock at night. Um, now there wasn't any additional funding for that, and um, it meant that we had to change how we worked a lot. Now Sonia speaks of all of the organisations that spoke to Women's Aid to try and support their workplace policies, with the exception of a very few, for instance, Danske Bank. Um, uh, they, they weren't asking the Men's Advisory Project of how they would support male victims. Now, Sonia does a brilliant job, as do Women's Aid, when they speak about victims, because they always speak about all victims. Um, and we can't thank them enough for that. But again, we must look at why is it that when we're looking for work workplace policies, we're not considering what happens to men, what happens to those in same-sex relationships. You know, we're thinking truly about what happens to women and, and girls. Now, domestic abuse is, as we've said, is a crime that impacts on everyone. Um, we saw our, our numbers rose by 100% during parts of, of the pandemic, and it was absolutely overwhelming. But at the same time, we we stepped into that because without it, there wasn't any other support. Um, so that safety planning or risk assessment and trying to let the world at large really see what it was like for those who faced domestic abuse was very important to us. And we tried really to communicate with you as MLAs as well to let you know what it was like for men who were experiencing domestic abuse. Um, I think one of the things that we would have heard a lot of, we would have had a lot of family members phoning us as well and speaking about being so worried about, fam you know, about male brothers, um, you know, nephews, grandsons, all that sort of thing, sons a lot um, because they couldn't see them anymore and they had been worried previously, but it was that sort of low level of worry and they could see them often enough. Once they no longer could see them or um, those sort of isolation tactics had been increased further and then further by COVID, there, there was so much distress placed on wider families. And I think, you know, that's also something that we need to look at. When we talk about this bill, we're talking about how it is that we keep people having a safety raft of work. You know, isolation um, and financial isolation is, up, uh, you know, financial control. These are absolutely the tools of an abuser. So impacting on you in a way that you lose your job, this is often something that is deliberately done by an abuser. So this is why when we think of these things and we think of how much more dangerous it is for people living at home and away from their work. Um, you know, it's really good that we're thinking about these policies and how we can layer this in and bring, um, bring awareness to workplaces and to the country. So I think that's a, just an excellent question and thank you for, for asking us. Okay, thank you folks. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Stephen. Um, John, can we bring John into the spotlight, please? <sighs> Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm not sure I have a question. I may get their question, but I, I want to commend Sonia and Rhonda on one of the most powerful and informative presentations I've received on this committee uh, over my period of time in this last two years. Uh, and Rhonda made a very good point in relation to, and as is Sonia, in relation to there's no point in passing legislation unless people know about it and unless that legislation uh, is enacted and is workable. Uh, and Rhonda used the term that we should celebrate this legislation and similar legislation on the point of view that we are a society who will no longer stand by and allow uh, abuse to take place. And we want to support the victims of abuse. And we as legislators can do that, uh, not through tea and sympathy, but through legislation, which, which works. So I commend you on your presentation and commend you on your work. As the presentation was going on, I, I was thinking about a case I dealt with a number of years ago, and the figures speak for themselves. The vast majority of victims of domestic abuse are women and girls. The vast majority of perpetrators are men. But I'm going to just speak on this case because it goes to what my potential question is. I, I, I dealt with a man who was a big, physically strong man. He was the sort of guy if you ran into on the football pitch, you would need stretchered off. That big man. But that guy come to me one time and told me a story of the physical abuse and psychological abuse he was receiving at home. And I was in shock because look at Adam, you know, 
we as lads of students go through learning processes as well. Uh, and, and I learned a lot from that, from that, from that issue. But I, I signposted him towards support and all those sorts of things. But I was thinking of that man, if he was to work, walk into his employer in a male-dominated work environment and tell them that he's a victim of domestic abuse, I think his employer would be shocked. I don't know if his employer would be able to support him, but it goes back to the point uh, you were making earlier on, that we need to have information out to employers. We need to support employers in this. And we need to make people aware of the legislation and the rights they have. So it's not so much a question, but the other point I want to make is this also. The presentation is quite timely because we're approaching the Christmas period, which we're told is a very happy period. It is for very many, many people. It's a very happy and joyful time. It's also a very dangerous time for many people. A very, very dangerous time. Um, and if there's a message to consider this committee today, it is that there is support and there is another way out there for you. Uh, yeah. As easy as it is for me to say that, because uh, it's not as easy when you're in, in the midst of that, but there is support and there is protection for you uh, out there as well. So, But it goes back to the point that a number of members have raised this in fairness. How do we ensure that hopefully this, well, hopefully when this legislation passes, that people are aware of it and they're able to use it? Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, I'm not sure if either Sonia or Rhonda wants to come in and respond to that, but I think you have made really important points there. Sonia, you want to come in? I, I just wanted to come in with regard to the resourcing because this is a huge issue. You know, we have a, a new piece of domestic abuse legislation that it was, you know, stated within the House, or you know, that it was only going through because there was no money attached to it. That's no good. That's a piece of paper that's going to sit there. You know, you need resourcing, and that is for those public awareness campaigns, for that training and development, and for things to work properly to really make changes to people's lives. You know, so I know we're in a very difficult budget time. You know, and we look forward to to seeing and commenting on the draft budget as we normally do. But it's very very difficult times ahead. But there are people, often the most vulnerable in our society, that are experiencing domestic abuse. And without these models of work and, and this really game-changing piece of legislation for so many people. And for me, it doesn't matter if 10 people take it up or a 1,000 people take it up. It's there and it's awareness. It's bigger than actually the cost that it's going to have to the employer. You know, it's about that awareness piece that could take place during this um, that is more impactful, I think. Perfect. Um, I think the other thing, thanks so much for your comments, by the way, uh, John, they were, um, I think, perfectly put. I think there's a bit of a misnomer in that uh, there's an idea that you can only support um, women and girls or men and boys. And that is so far from um, what we see in the sector. We see people who need help. Um, we see people who need support. And um, whilst um, I work for the Men's Advisory Project, or Sonia works for Women's Aid. Um, you know, we work together all the time to try and ensure that the net and, and the support network for, for those who face abuse is, is there and is strengthened day by day. The one thing I would say is I would love our MLAs to speak more about domestic abuse, to speak about it all the time. And I know that that might sound like a bit of a boring, a, a boring drum to beat, but if we spoke about it in an inclusive and open way uh, all the time, and when we were looking at, you know, at bills, we were thinking, okay, so you know, we're going to bring through this bill. How is that going to impact women's aid? How will it impact MAP? What money needs to be attached to that? If, if men are, are seeking to flee to safety, where do they go? You know, if women need to, to seek, seek, flee to safety, where do they go? Is there enough space in refuge? Have we, have, we have we increased funding toward refuge in years? These are all things that, we're in, that are within your grasp as part of your committee. And, you know, when, when we come to you, we come to you to try and put meat on the bones of a bill, but we also come to you to ask you to do a bit more. And I know you're, you know, I know we always try our best, and I know it's it's difficult at the moment given COVID. But the the suffering has continued, you know, this suffering has continued, 
and we keep trying to drag it out into public awareness. But unless we get support from all of the House, that won't happen. And that support, unfortunately, also has to include funding. Thank you. Um, I don't have any other members wanting to come in for, for questions now, um, but just I suppose to say again, thank you for your um, evidence this morning. I think you're very clearly set out for the committee why this legislation is needed. Um, and just to reiterate that point to anyone who, particularly in this festive season when we know that there, there are, are increased incidences of domestic abuse, to know that there is support available and there, there are organisations out there that will help and that, that will believe people when they come forward. So um, I think that you have really helped the committee this morning and I want to thank you again for um, coming along and sharing your evidence with us. Thanks for the opportunity today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Okay, Peter, do we need to pick up on any points? We have uh, a number of points coming out of the raise briefing that we take up directly with the department in terms of the scrutiny points, but also go back to raise with some questions around further research they can do for us in terms of the, the incidences we talked about and how systems have operated in other countries, whether or not burdens of proof or um, things of that kind of nature have limited take up um, of schemes that exist. So we we come back with that as soon as we can. And on that, so I'm sure obviously the clerk has it covered, but also I think the point both you and I had raised that if, if they either through raise whatever they could do effectively shows how the worked example of how yes, this, yeah, how this yeah, actually yeah. processes it almost like a flow chart of, of how the processes would operate for an individual in connection with the the be it HMRC, be it the the Dell or AME side of things on that. I think just help us get our, our minds around a little bit just in terms of where the follow through just is on that. Yep, we'll go ahead and do that. Okay. Okay, then. So we're going to move on to item number six, which is matters arising. Um, there's just a few things here. There's a response from the Department of Page 56 regarding the ARIA bill and the potential impact of any changes um, to Article 10 of the protocol. Bez has stated that subsidy control state aid compliance is primarily an operational but not legislative issue for ARIA. Um, we do not foresee any legislative changes to the ARIA bill as a result of the potential removal of Article 10 of the protocol. Additionally, any changes to Article 10 uh, would not affect any the wording of the MOU um, regarding um, ARIA. So that's for members to note. Um, there in 6.2 then, there's a clarification from Gemma Dolan, MLA, at page 58 regarding her briefing at last week's um, committee meeting. And Gemma would just like to state that an omission was made in response to Stuart regarding the Small Business Enterprise and Employment Act 2015. And Gemma can confirm that the Act was referenced in the Assembly research and that her bill will be using a similar definition of ZOR contracts and will also seek to ban exclusivity clauses. So that's for members to note okay. as well. Then 6.3, there is correspondence from Darien Straban District Council at page 59 regarding the parental bereavement leave and pay bill. The council urges that legislation goes further so everyone who's bereaved of a close relative or partner is also entitled to two weeks statutory bereavement leave. So if um, members are content that we would write back to Darien Straban uh, District Council indicating the committee's amendments to the bill, the time scale involved which limited further work and that obviously the committee did include in its recommendation in our bill report that further work is undertaken in the new mandate. The members are happy enough with that. Agreed. Then 6.4 there is a copy of the Hansard on the ARIA bill briefing at page 62 um, to note. And then 6.5, there is a copy of the letter from the Department of Finance at page 7 of table paper regarding the committee's inquiry about whether a windfall tax on conventional energy generators and VAT related interventions to offset the current fuel crisis. The finance minister is concerned about the impact of the energy crisis on consumers and businesses here. And as such, he wrote to the Chief Secretary of the Treasury on the 11th of November calling on Treasury to act quickly and suspend VAT on energy bills temporarily to support the many families and businesses facing an uncertain winter. And a response to that is still awaited. Um, that they are not aware of Bez's intention to introduce a windfall tax at this time. 
while the DOF has the lead role in liaising with Treasury on tax-related matters. DFE has not asked DOF to raise any additional matters that the Committee has outlined. So that is for members to note. Then at 6.6, .6, a copy of a letter from the Department of Communities at page 9 of table papers regarding the energy price crisis. Um, and it, just to advise that following the British Government's announcement of the £500 million of support for households over the winter, Treasury have subsequently confirmed that the Executive will receive £13.8 million. On the 9th of November, the Community Minister wrote to the Finance Minister asking for immediate consideration of the provisional allocation of that £13.8 million to enable an energy payment support scheme, and it is anticipated that this will be considered by the Executive as part of the January monitoring process. So that is for members to note as well. 6.7 then, there is a response from the Department of page 10 of table papers regarding COVID passports and whether the engagement forum on COVID-19 has been re-established. Um, so to advise members in that response that the consultation with business representative bodies in relation to COVID certification is led by TEO. However, DFE officials from the COVID restart team are present at these meetings and in regular contact with representative bodies from retail, hospitality and the event sector to discuss any issues arising. The Executive Office-led engagement forum on COVID-19 remains available and as such there is no requirement for it to be re-established. Meetings are much less frequent now than they were in the early stages of COVID, so that is for members to note. In 6.8, there is a response from the Department at page 11 of table papers regarding Project Stratum. And just to remind members that the PAC has asserted primacy and has undertaken an inquiry on the report's findings, and as such, the information in the response is restricted and shouldn't be shared. So um, that's also for members to note for now. Sorry, Chair. Yeah, go ahead, John. Can I just ask a question? On what basis is the information in that document restricted? Or who decides what is restricted? Peter, do you want to? The, the department has asked us to, to maintain a uh, restriction on it because of, I think, other things that are going on. And a lot of the information that we've got in this isn't necessarily finalised. It's still fairly few, fluid. Um, I, I think that they're concerned that the level of, of uh, speculation or discussion there's been around what will or will not be covered, um, it wouldn't be helpful to put information out there that isn't necessarily finalised. But there's, there's no legal basis or no, no legal onus on a committee to do so, or there's no procedural matter or standing order by which the department can instruct a committee that information they provide to us is restricted. Chair, the, the committee works a lot on protocol and procedure, and, and we, we work on the protocol that if we are requested to keep something restricted or confidential, that we do so. Um, and, and that's the case in this case. Also, the fact that the uh, PAC is now investigating. Um, previously, they've corresponded with us before about discussing information that's come um, that's relevant to an investigation they're doing while they're investigating. So that's another reason for the information to be limited circulation. Uh, I on, on, uh, appreciate and appreciate that, but I, I certainly have concerns on a department uh, placing bold print across a document restricted and then... Chair, Chair uh, I should intervene. We, we insin did insin insin in Oh, sorry, you said that. We, we well, did. Or the departments... Okay, well, I appreciate the clarification. But we are a scrutiny committee. Uh, it's open to the public. Um, and while we do have to have personal responsibility and responsibility around all these matters, uh, I, I favour openness and transparency rather than a department uh, seeking requests on restricting information. Okay, thanks for that, John. Um, so, Peter, what is our role now in relation to Project Stratum? We still have our ability to scrutinise the department's delivery of so Project Stratum, we, we, regardless we, of what the PAC is doing. We are in a position where they have asserted um, primacy on looking at the investment itself. However, the committee is still able to do scrutiny where it doesn't 
cut across that inquiry. So in terms of the rollout and so on, that, that's not necessarily what PAC's inquiry is looking at. It's looking at uh, members will have seen yesterday across the media and, and from what the CNAG said, they're looking more at the value for money aspect of it. There is some crossover, but we, we will carefully navigate that with the committee and, and where committee have queries and so on. As I said before, I can discuss with PAC Clark what they're doing and we can work around that. Yeah, I think it's important that the committee does have the ability to continue to scrutinise the rollout um, and obviously the information that's contained within the document is something that we will want the committee to have a, a full oral briefing on it at some point in the near future as soon as that can be tied down. We, we'll work with the PAC committee chair to ensure that that can happen. Okay, so we'll move on then um, to item number seven, which is the small scale green energy bill. There's a response from the Department for Communities um, at page 68 regarding a raised scrutiny point on whether it has an estimate of the proportion of households at the risk of falling into fuel poverty. In 2016, 22% of households were in fuel poverty. In 2017, it was 17%. In 2018, it was 18%. There is no further modelled estimates that have been produced. However, a ready reckoner table has been supplied <coughs> to the poten potential changes. So that is for members to note. And obviously, the increased costs currently and the amount that people are spending, obviously, on the energy bills will change those figures. Chair, absolutely, and the, the committee's aware of the um, meetings that the Department for Communities, Department for the Economy, Consumer Council and the Utility Regulator are having. Uh, also, the um, scheme that the Department for Finance is putting together around um, payments to mitigate the higher cost of, of energy, um, particularly going into the winter. Yep. Okay, so then... There is, that's for members to note. Then there is also a raised briefing note at page 71 regarding microgeneration support schemes in other jurisdictions. That's also for members to note. There's a copy of the Hansard from the Utility Regulators briefing at page 76, from NIE Networks briefing at page 87. Um, and we are going to now go into closed session and move to um, item number 14, which is the committee's deliberations on the small scale green energy bill. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. Okay, so we're back live again, uh, members, and we are now moving to item number eight, which is the Domestic Abuse Safe Leave Bill. And just to refer members to a number of items there for noting um, as well, um, there is a Hansard from the meeting on the 1st of December, a copy of the Neath Port, not, Port Talbot County's Domestic Abuse Workplace Policy, um, a copy of South Ayrshire Council's Safe Leave Policy, and um, a written submission on the bill by Northern Ireland's Women's European Platform at page 27 of Table Papers. So it's just to seek members' agreement to include those um, as part of the committee's bill report. Okay, okay. thank you. So moving on then to item number nine, which is the draft budget. There's a copy of the written ministerial budget at page 200 of our packs. There is a copy of the draft budget at page 39 of Table Papers. 
copy of the Finance Minister's oral statement to the Assembly at page 136 of table papers and just to advise members under the draft budget, the department's budget will increase by 1.8% in 2022-23, 3% in 23 24 and 2.9% in 24 25 so all of that obviously is for committee to note at this point, and we will come back to it um, over the next number of weeks as yes, the consultation. Once, once continues. the consultation finishes, um, we will come back to it then and seek briefing. Um, I think the finance committee will probably write to us. They're looking at a process, uh, which will uh, allow us to feed into a, a wider response from them. Okay. Moving on then, item number 10, there is a departmental written briefing on January monitoring. It's at page 224 of our PACs. So it's to note at this stage, and I assume we'll be getting a briefing in we'll, early in the we'll new year. We'll briefing, and that, and that will form part of what's being done around the budget as well, Chair. Okay. Okay, so moving on then to correspondence, 11.1, um, there's a copy of a written ministerial statement from the Finance Minister on the RHI disciplinary process, page 232, that's for members to note. Then there is a copy of correspondence from the Education Committee at page 235 regarding questions for the Department about the period products free provision bill, so if members are content we'll forward those questions on to the Department for response. 11.3, then there's a copy of a letter from the Communities Committee to the Department for the Economy at page 241 regarding funding for the utility regulator, so that's for members to note. Then there is a copy of a letter shared by the Finance Committee at page 242 from the House of Lords European Affairs Subcommittee on the Protocol to the Financial Secretary to the Treasury regarding a proposed EU directive and the interaction of the protocol um, from the Emissions Trading Directive, and I assume we probably had the same correspondence. We did, Chair. Um, then 11.5, there's a copy of a letter shared by the Finance Committee from the Department of Finance, providing an update on the Department's consideration of the Financial Services Union suggestion relating to a banking forum and suggests that it engages in this regard with the all-party group on fair banking and finance. And if members contempt, we will respond to that committee, indicating the committee awaits the finding of the report. Right. 11.6 then, there is the Audit Office report on the Small Business Grant Scheme at page 252. Um, and that's for members to note at this point, but when the Minister comes in, I assume we can pick it up. We can pick up on that. Um, I think that is one, I need to check whether that's one that the PAC is going to look at. Okay. I think it's on their yeah. list. Um, I'll check back on that. Okay, then at 11.7 to 11.12, there are copies of the annual reports and accounts for the six regional colleges. So the Comptroller and Auditor General has indicated that he's content with the accounts of all six colleges. So those are for members to note. Then 11.13, there is a copy of the uh, Human Rights Commission's annual statement at page 845. So that's for members to note. Um, like we've duplicated yeah. that. Okay. <laughs> Moving on then to 11.15, there's correspondence from Aparo Restaurant in Draperstown at page 11. 49 of our packs regarding the introduction of vaccine passports. So if members are content that we will forward that to the department, as the owner has indicated she's seeking a response from the economy minister. So members happy enough with that? Thank you. 11.16 then, there is a copy of a letter from the Department of Finance regarding the monthly outturn round seven for October at page 158 of table papers. That's for members to note. Then there is a copy of a letter from the Committee for Finance regarding the lack of clarity surrounding the governance of the City Deals programme at page 183 of Table Papers, which is for members to note <coughs> also. And then 11.18, there is a Department Briefing regarding the review of the Financial Process Update at page 220 of Table Papers. So that is also for members to note. There is a letter from the Minister for Disabled People, Health and Work to the House of Lords Chair of Protocol on to the Chair of the Protocol Committee at page 224 of Table Papers regarding the classification, labelling and packaging of substances and mixtures. That's for members to note. 
Then there are three letters from Bez to the chair of the EU subcommittee on the protocol, um, which are also for members to note. Then there is a copy of the NI Chamber Invest NI report on Brexit one year on at page 232 of table papers, which is for members also to note. There is a letter from the Workspace Group at page 269 of table papers um, in relation to the loss of e, um, ESF funding. So if members are happy enough, we will pass that on to the department. And obviously this is an issue that we have been in significant correspondence with the department in relation to. And the specific issue in the letter refers to um, match funding, which I think we are already waiting yeah, on a response from it. the department in relation to. Um, so then 11.25, there's a copy of the audit office report on the contract award and management of Project Stratum, which we've already discussed. Um, 11.26, there's a letter from an individual at page 350 of table papers regarding regulation in the university sector. That is for members to note. And then there is another letter from an individual regarding value for money in the university sector, which again is for members to note. Um, and then moving on to item number 12, which is any other business, and none has been highlighted thus far. Go ahead, Stuart. Well, just very briefly, Chair, the High Street vouchers, which um, the reality is that a news story today says there are still some 8,000 applications outstanding. Those people are not going to be in a position to um, either spend or can hopefully be happy considering how they might spend their money, but they're not going to be in a position uh, between now and the closure to do that. Can we once again invite the Minister to give serious consideration to a reopening of the scheme and a plea to people that they should hold on to cards and detail over the Christmas holiday if they really are not advised to date uh, about their cards? Peter, uh, yeah. I know that, uh, and even during the course of the meeting, I'm, I'm having messages from colleagues who yeah. are still trying to get responses yeah. to individuals. Um, and obviously, we appreciate. The, I think the last batch of cards has gone out, so people won't know yet of whether they've got them or not. And MLAs are still waiting for responses to ones that they sent in at the end of last week, so they don't know whether or not people who they've corresponded about are going to get cards or not. So, I, I appreciate that. There's a high volume of correspondence has went into the department, but that people are still really wanting to know the outcome in relation to the queries they have put in. So if there's any way that the department can look at getting responses out, and as Stuart has said, perhaps it's looking at whether we can extend it up to Christmas Eve to allow people to get to spend their money that they, they have, especially if they're only getting cards like tomorrow or Friday and they only have to Sunday to spend it. Obviously, you know, people might be able to get out over the weekend, but Perhaps the minister would look at extending it that little bit sure, further, or as Stuart has says, reopening in the new year. I'm not necessarily hostile to that, but I mean, I suppose the issue is, I suppose what we really need is clarification from the department. I'm conscious of the fact that we've got to be a little bit careful that if there is simply an extension with that, and particularly if we're talking about uh, an extension, an extension to, if you take, for instance, a Christmas Eve, whether that, that seems to be that additional spend will almost entirely be effectively displacement spend and I, I could see with that for instance it would come under certain level of criticism from an audit point of view. Um, but you know whether there's bespoke arrangements for those who've received them late or whatever, but I think I think we just need to get really that bit of clarification. I'm not hostile to things at least being looked at in terms of timing, for instance, on that on that basis. But it may also be that, for example, if there's a group of people who through no fault of their own have received things late, well there's bespoke arrangements for them, well that's not practical. I don't I don't know in connection with that. I'm a wee bit more conscious of the fact of somebody who maybe got the card a month ago and hasn't really bothered. You know, I, I think they're in a different category, really, to be honest, from... from uh, and maybe that, that in some cases that some of the late um, issuing is on the basis that people haven't supplied the information, have been very late in doing so. You know, so I think we just a wee bit of care needs to be taken in relation to this. I think we just need mm. a wee bit of clarification as to where things stand. Chair, sure, we're aware of an appeals process. It might be useful just to get a better idea of detail around how that will work, mm -hmm. um, how it will apply. Will it apply to people who say, for example, the card actually literally turns up on Monday um, after you know, the, the, the deadline? Will, will they be automatically able to access an appeal process to have that, have that money or whatever? And how will it work? Yeah. How will it work? Um, 
Peter, could we ask for some urgent clarity around the, the issues that have been raised and, and if that could be communicated to members as quickly as possible? Because yeah. obviously we are really yes. coming down to the wire on it. Okay, thanks for that, members. Um, so moving on then to item number 13, which is the date, time and place of the next meeting, which is Wednesday the 12th of January at 10 a.m. in this building. So just to wish all members a, a very happy and peaceful Christmas. Thank you. Assembly, committee room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.